One thing you can be sure of with any harmonica, somebody somewhere has given the thing personal hands-on attention. Every reed in every mouth organ is tuned by hand with a tiny file. The parts, though, are turned out by machines. In the case of the Zeidel factory at Klingenthal in Saxony, the same machines that were used 130 years ago. Brass reeds of varying lengths are stamped out and mounted on a fixed plate. As air flows in or out of the harmonica, they vibrate to produce different musical tones. The most popular harmonica is the ten-hole diatonic, whose blow reeds and draw reeds combine to give the player a standard major scale, like the white notes on a piano keyboard. Historically, the harmonica is a free reed instrument from the same family as accordions and concertinas. And as usual, it was the Chinese who first made music in that way, through the medium of the sheng. Basically, the principle is free flowing reeds, which is suck and blow, like bellows or breathing in and out, which is what the harmonica does. And this is from Thailand, this is called, it's called a calm. And it sounds a bit like this, but it's free flowing reeds. It's bamboo and it's got wax around the chamber here. And there's this finger, this holes on it for, to change the notes. So I can give you an idea by playing a little bit, if you like. Which you go. So who invented the harmonica as we know it today? By common consent, it came out of German-speaking lands, but beyond that, it's a comedy of claim, counterclaim, and denial. We cannot answer this question. There were many inventors, many people tried to construct instruments with free reeds in Vienna, in Paris, in London, in Thuringia, also very early in Trossing. Nobody knows exactly who invented the harmonica, but uh, there are many stories. and. I know the name Friedrich Buschmann. One name always pops up, which is Buschmann. There's no special name, not Mr. Buschmann. Family letters from 1828 state that Friedrich Buschmann had a harmonica of his own devising, but it seems certain the instrument had been seen in Vienna at least three years before that. There were no factories then. It was a question of individual craftsmen, and one of the earliest artisans to make harmonicas in Germany was called Christian Messner. You know, here in the Black Forest, on the border of the Black Forest, we, have, we had a lot of clockmakers and also in Trossing lived clockmakers and they used to travel to sell their clocks and when they came back they brought some presents for their families and so on. And one of these presents in the mid-1820s must have been a little harmonica from Vienna. And Messner noticed, oh it's nice, he played, he repaired and his comrades asked Oh, make me a harmonica too, I want. And he noticed it's a good business. And so he switched to the first harmonica maker in southwest Germany, maybe before Saxony and other countries, but after Vienna. From that point on, Trossingen in southern Germany became the harmonica's semi-official home. Only 15,000 inhabitants, but three music colleges, a harmonica museum, and an amazing concentration of top players. This quartet alone contains two world champions. The chap on the end is product manager at the Hohner Company. Hohner, the maker's name most of us think of first. Matthias Hohner, the founder, was, as the Germans say, a school comrade of Christian Messner. But to borrow the Messner family's expertise, he had to resort to espionage. One generation before Hohner, a Christian Messner started, and it was a family secret of this Messner family how to make harmonicas until the 1850s. But then a nephew of the Messners, Christian Weiss, uh, started his own uh, business, and he was a school comrade of Hohner. Hohner visited this school camera, Christian Weiss, to get the secret, how does he make the harmonica? So he was like, like you can visit the school camera, oh, hello, say hello. And after some hours, they noticed, oh, Hona is, is looking, and he was kicked out. And with this kick out, the big career of Hona started in 1856, here in the town of Trossing. And one year later, he officially founded his shop, 150 years ago. 
But he had no other choice. He had to be a spy because it was family secret of Messner and Weiss. One of his strategies was to buy anybody else who was also producing harmonicas at the same time. So, and trusting in you had dozens of harmonica factories and in the end you had two, three and then nowadays you have only home. They made millions and millions for all countries of the world and the biggest time was just before radio and gramophone and all these things came up and in this time the German harmonica makers produced every year 50 millions, 50 millions for all over the world for the export, every year. German immigrants brought the harmonica with them to, to America and it's researched that in, in regions where the German immigrants in the USA played harmonica, there were black farmers too, or black people, and they heard it, and they used the harmonica then for blues. So it's a, and, and, and there's a link between German immigration and black people hearing the harmonica played in, in USA. The, the reason why this got into the blues in the way that it did is its inexpensiveness, which is a thing of the past. Little Walter was quoted as saying, when I started to play harmonicas, they were a dime. Now they're a dollar and a half. Those people ought to remember who popularized them that way, you know. The term harp denoting a harmonica may come directly from the Karl Esbach Company, two of whose early models were marketed under the name French harp. Some earlier simple models with long reeds attached to a reed plate actually looked a little like a harp, and you could almost think of the Jews or Jaws harp as a one-pronged version. For the classically minded, there's also the tradition of the Aeolian harp, an outdoor instrument randomly activated by the wind passing over strings. It's structured like a harp in that a harp has strings going from long to short. It's not like you're playing a saxophone or a guitar even where you're shortening the strings that you have. You're using the the various lengths of string on a harp and on the harmonica you're using various lengths of brass reeds so in, in a sense it's structured like a harp you can glissando in a sense like a harp in the sense that you can rush the harmonica past your mouth and a, harp, a harpist can move their fingers along the, the harp so there are some similarities in that way otherwise I, I wouldn't be surprised if the fact that they have the same three first letters had something to do with it <laughs> We know that the first African-American to record on a harmonica, Pete Hampton, called his instrument a mouth organ because mouth organ coon was the unfortunate title of the record he made in 1904. It was a couple of decades later that the mouth harp joined in with the new blues craze. For that to happen, there had to be a radical departure from the manufacturer's intentions. I think um, the blues gets a lot of um, harp players started. So uh, most, most of them use this um, harmonica here, which is the ten-hole diatonic. And I mean, it, was, it wasn't designed for playing blues, it was designed for, by the Germans for... It's got a, um, basically two chords down the bottom end, a blow and a suck. And um, they're there so that you could play the, right, play the melody in the middle octave out of the right-hand side of your mouth and slap your tongue off on the left-hand side to get this kind of like Bavarian umpa pa sort of style. I'm not very good at it, but this is roughly what the Germans intended for the harmonica. And you can hear that, there's that kind of chordal accompaniment going on there. In fact, it was Brian Jones who taught me the trick, as it were, cross harp. Up until that point, I had vaguely been able to play the odd Jimmy Reed phrase <laughs> um, because he, he played harp in, in first position, um, which is the key it's in. And uh, 
this is why most of the time he stayed at the top end of the harp, which is where you can most easily bend the notes in first position. And um, so you get that kind of particular Jimmy Reed style, which uh, all the Louisiana players copied. And um, that was, I couldn't even do that really, but I could have a go at it. And then Brian said, no, 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 cross harp is what you do. You take a C harmonica and don't play it in C, play it in G. And so that was it, that was a breakthrough for me. If I have a harmonica in the key of A, I will be playing, playing blues in the key of E. Yeah? So all harmonica players have a small table in their harmonica holders so that they know what key is. It's actually in the circle of fifths. And so you take the wrong harmonica to play the correct music and you play it completely differently than you would a German song. Suddenly the harmonica market was exploding, sponsored by the stars, and specialist stars of playing began to appear. In the south, one of the unlikeliest favourites in the white stronghold of the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville was the black harmonica pioneer DeFord Bailey. I mean, I can understand how he could be on the Grand Ole Opry every week, week in, week out, or at least very, very often, um, because it must have been amazing to people who just played Turkey in the Straw and things like that, to hear what this guy could do. It's groundbreaking. And so he, he therefore becomes another person who's important in the development of what came after. Joe Filisco demonstrates Bailey's hectic train sound. Everybody had to do a train thing, and everybody had to do a fox chase type thing, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Do you know, I've never perfected one of those, although I've been playing for over 40 years. But while the harmonica was establishing itself as part of the indispensable kit of blues band and jug band, it was still struggling for respect elsewhere in the world. This, in spite of its noble performance in two world wars, where it not only comforted the soldiery, but on occasion saved their lives. Some soldiers in both world wars, there were soldiers saving or keeping their life by coincidence when the harmonica was on the right place in the uniform when the, and the bullet or the part of a shell hit the harmonica and not the body of the soldier. Hurrah was purportedly the cry every good German soldier gave when war was declared. And Honer, ever the opportunist, capitalized on their patriotism. Although Hona harmonicas remain handmade in Trossingen to this day, there was a brief wartime period when the crafty Honerites started up elsewhere. He would pick the same model and change just the cover plates, and in the wars, it, this was very clearly. The Hona managers decided to found a branch factory, a little one in Switzerland. It's close to here, and so they made a harmonica label Helvetia Harmonica, and <laughs> and they printed the, the soldiers of the enemy countries in this time on these boxes uh, and sold it as Helvetia Harmonica to England and France and these countries. It was a big scandal. But Hohner told the, the politicians um, it was to get money from, from other countries and we will, we will turn or we will switch to other boxes. So they stopped to make the, the, the soldiers on it, but they continued to, to sell Helvetia Harmonica to England and France for until 1916. 